Testing, okay, let's get started. Welcome to CS4510, Electro 13A. Uh, it's kind of loud. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, the So basically, last time, what did we do? We talked about uh, Gödel incompleteness. We talked about uh, the halting problem. We talked about how there might. Uh, let me fix this. Testing, testing. Okay, that's much better. Um, we talked about how. Um, uh, Gödel incompleteness. Uh, we talked about how Gödel is able to show that there I exists uh, unprovable statements, and then we talked about uh, Alan Turing's work about how there exists undecidable languages. There exists algorithmically unsolvable problems. You can come up with a problem that uh, has no algorithmic solution. Uh, today we're going to talk about more uh, undecidable problems, and but instead of proving a problem to be undecidable. Uh, by repeating the diagonalization argument that Alan Turing did, uh, that argument is kind of long. So instead, what we can do is sort of reuse the proof of a of diagonalization and just simply transform it. So what we're going to do really is relate several problems, several undecidable problems together, such that the solvability of one implies the solvability of another, and so on. And uh, the, the, there is some intuition you should bring today uh, from NP completeness, maybe if you recall how like uh, the hardness of one problem applies the hardness of another through a reduction. It's a very similar idea today. So the language first we're going to talk about. Last time we talked about halt, uh, which was this language of an, a pairs of strings and words and codings. So I said m is a Turing machine, m halts on w. So the input to the machine w causes uh, m to halt. Uh, so it's the a set of pairs of machines and words. And we proved that this language was undecidable by using Alan Turing's diagonalization uh, technique. We assumed it was decidable, and we, cre we used its construction to create a, a diagonal, and then we ran the diagonal on itself. And we showed that the diagonal uh, uh, forces a contradiction. Um, there's a similar language to HALT called ATM, which, is called, which really means the acceptance problems, for, uh, acceptance problems for Turing machines. And given a pair of M uh, W, instead of M HALT and W, it says M accepts W. So not only does M halt on W, but M has to turn on the green light. M accepts it instead of rejects it. Um, so if we had to guess, A, T, M, undecidable or decidable? Undecidable. Um, why? It basically seems very, uh, uh, related to halt. And it's worth mentioning here that the Sipser book um, proves that A, T, M is undecidable by uh, diagonalization, and it relates that back to halt using a reduction. Um, but we proved halt was undecidable by diagonalization, and we're going to do not necessarily a reduction, but we're going to relate uh, this decidability of ATM to the known undecidability of halt. So um, assume to the contrary that ATM is decidable. We give A decider for halt. So we're going to assume to the contrary that ATM is decidable and use that to give a decider for halt. This construction is actually pretty straightforward. It's going to be H on input. It wants to decide halt, so we're going to give it. It's going to take in pair uh, M and W. Um, then basically, if a machine accepts we know it halts. If a machine rejects, we know it halts. When you write code, you can't say if loops, because you don't know if it loops or if it just hasn't finished yet. So you can never say if loops. But however, if it doesn't accept and it doesn't reject, then you know implicitly it has to loop. So that's kind of what the, the idea is here. So like uh, if m, w is in ATM, 
We can say this line because we assume to the contrary that ATM is decidable, and then there, therefore there exists a decider for it. We could name the decider and give this uh, string to the decider, and whatever it returns, we would determine that, right? But I can just write it like this. So if m, comma w is in ATM, we know that m accepts w. So that means we know m halts on w, so we can accept. Uh, else, uh, we're going to build m prime from m swapping uh, q a q r. So we swap the states q a and q r. And recall that the definition of a Turing machine to accept and reject states are more like instructions than they are states. Like uh, in, a, in a DFA or something, you can enter the state and then leave it and then enter and then hope you just end there. When you enter the accept or reject state, you're done. The computation is finished. You can't do anything else. And so in that sense, the accepting and rejecting operation is kind of arbitrary, right? What's the difference between accepting and rejecting is just whatever we say. So you can just make uh, the Turing machine wire that goes to the light on just make it go to the light off or something, right? So we're just, we can just swap the denote, the, uh, whatever those two states denote, and then we have m prime. Now notice that if m, um, if uh, m comma w, m prime comma w is in ATM, that means m prime accepted uh, w. But if m prime accepted w, the QA state in M prime was reached because we swapped the states. That means M, not M prime, but M rejected W. And if M rejects W, we know that it halts on W. So here we can say accept as well because we know that we halt on W. And if we don't accept on W, and if we don't reject on W, what happens? We have to loop, right? So we can't say if loops, but we can test the other conditions using this decider for ATM, and then we can just say reject, because we know we must loop. So this is a decider uh, for ATM. Uh, excuse me, this is a decider for halt given a decider for ATM, but we prove via diagonalization that halt is undecidable. Therefore, ATM, this such a decider for ATM that is used to build this decider for halt cannot exist, and therefore we see that ATM is undecidable. Is ATM recognizable? No. Why not? I thought it was if you, in order to be decidable, you need to be, sorry, if you said recognizable. Recognizable. In order to be recognizable, you need to be decidable. Or is it the other way around? Right. Well, so we, we proved, uh, so the decidables are a subset of the recognizable because the, rec the deciders have to halt on all inputs, but if the answer is wrong, the recognizers can loop. So can you, if, a, if m comma w is supposed to be in ATM, can you always give me a positive answer? Sure. So basically, like, if you can assume, the, you have two cases. If m comma w is in ATM, then you know the machine halts on it. It's not just halts on it, but accepts it. So the, the recognizer for ATM is the same as the recognizer for halt. What you're going to do is run M on W, and if it accepts W, you accept. If it loops, so do you. So for the similar, uh, for the similar reason as halt, ATM is recognizable. Here's a recognizer. We'll call it R on input uh, M, comma W. Uh, simulate. M on W, and accept if it accepts. If it rejects, we reject. Uh, if it loops, so do we, right? We're just going to keep simulating that program. So if M does accept W, we will accept. If M does not accept W, we will not accept. That's sufficient for us to be a recognizer. So we see that ATM is recognizable. Um, to a similar reason to halt, we know that ATM complement cannot be recognizable. Why? We proved that if a language and its complement are both recognizable, then the language has to be decidable. We, gave, we ran the two recognizers in parallel to build a decider. Right? So we proved like if L 
if uh, L and L complement are both recognizable, then uh, L is decidable. Right. So they both can't be recognizable. They both be recognizable. Otherwise, they would be decidable. Uh, but we've proved it's undecidable. So ATM, we, but by giving a recognizer for ATM, we can know we know then that the complement of ATM cannot even be recognizable. It's a similar reason to halt. So halt is also undecidable and recognizable, and a, halt complement is also not even recognizable, unrecognizable. So this is a the the point of today's lecture is this is this idea, but uh, sort of generalized on steroids, where we're going to take a problem and rather than having to repeat. Uh, the reduction, excuse me, rather than having to repeat a diagonalization argument, we can just sort of relate it to other known problems. Uh, and by using these problems together, we can prove undecidability of a certain problem without having to do some, uh, something complicated. And this is useful as the problems get more and more, um, they may get more and more ugly. In some sense, halt and ATM are very simple problems, but we'll see there are some, some, some more complicated problems. So, uh, this is, we're gonna now we're gonna talk about reductions in general, and it may help to recall some stuff from NP completeness reductions. So recall that f uh, from sigma star to sigma star as a function on strings is computable or Turing computable if there exists a Turing machine which uh, halts on all inputs. It begins with W on the tape and ends with F of W on the tape. So in some sense, the computable functions are the largest class of functions. Um, if a function, if there exists an algorithm to compute any function, then uh, the function is computable. Uh, the Turing machine, be given f of w, will halt with f of w. Excuse me, given just w, will halt with f of w on the tape. And this is what it means for, it, it loops on no inputs. Um, so this is uh, the definition of a computable function. Uh, for any uh, two languages, so a comma b, which are subsets of sigma star, uh, we say... A is many one, or mapping. Sipser renames this. He calls this mapping reducible, which is fine because there's not really it's not really obvious how it's going from many things to one thing. For the why is it called a many one reduction? But we say for any two languages, we say A is many one reducible to B, and we write this as A a less than or equal to M B, if there exists a, a computable function f uh, such that uh, w is in a if and only if f of w is in b. So f of w is in some sense a transformation of problems from a to problems in b. If we know something is in A, then we know that f of w must be in B. So knowing something about uh, uh, B, we can know, and the, comp and the transformation f, we can determine something about A. This is kind of like um, what we did in like 3510, where you're trying to take the good of like a problem and map it to also the good. Let me draw you the picture right map now. Map the bad to the bad. So let's say this is A and this is B. It maps the good to the good, and because, because this is an if and only if, it must map the bad um, to the bad. Right? So here's the bad, or the complement. Right? What's the difference between this definition and a definition of NP-completeness? Are we now just talking about, like, accepting strings? And, like, accepting Ws and not accepting Ws? So this is a mapping or many one reduction. There's a little m here. At least in 3510 algorithms, we would write a less than equal, and we put a p here for b for a polynomial time reducibility. 
But in the definition, it is exactly a reduction. It's the same definition. But there's one word missing between these, this definition and the polynomial time reducibility. Between many one reducibility and polynomial time reducibility, there's this one small miss difference between them. Is it about that in one of them you could map to like a subset of each? Or no, not really? You could still do that here, certainly. Okay. As long as it's, this is allowed. Basically, the answer I'm looking for is that the point of the poly, polynomial time reduce, reduction has to be computable, not only computable, but computable in polynomial time. The reduction itself has to take polynomial time. Here, the reduction just has to be computable at all. It's a huge generalization, right? Um, by the way, all polynomial time, all these NP-complete languages, those are also all decidable, right? There is an exponential time algorithm for SAT, so it certainly it's decidable. So that's a very that's a very different field of questions. Here we're concerned. While well, NP-completeness may help you, oh wow, three people. While well, NP-completeness may help you. Um, say which problems are harder or easier than another. For example, if I were to write this, we would know that the difficulty of B, quote unquote, is greater than the difficulty of A, kind of loosely, that's our intuition. So like B lower bounds, excuse me, A lower bounds B or B upper bounds A. So like B was in P, then A would be in P because A is like easier, quote unquote. In some senses, there's almost a similar analogy you could make here because B does upper bound A and A does lower bound B. Um, but it's not about hardness, because we are not on that union yet. It's about unsolvability. So in some sense, if, like, I'll write it this way. Uh, there's four facts. Uh, four, oh, it's right here. If we have a reduction from A to B, uh, if B is decidable, then we know A is, like, less decidable than B. So B, A definitely has to be decidable. Excuse me, A, has to, a, a is decidable. Right. These, these, I'm going to give four facts. These all require proof, but I'm just, they follow the intuition if you understand what the symbol means, which the, the direction is going. Um, uh, if A is undecidable, uh, A lower bounds B, so like B is more undecidable than A, so B can't be decidable. B has to also be undecidable. Uh, if B is recognizable, if B is recognizable, uh, then A is, has to be more solvable than B. So that means A also is recognizable. And here's an important one we'll use later. If A is unrecognizable, uh, if A is run, unrecognizable, then B can't even be recognizable. So if you think of this like an axial direction, um, like here's the easiest languages, and here's the hardest languages. So let's say this is the decidable, this is the recognizable. And this is the undecided. This is the unrecognizable, right? So, beyond this point, everything there are. This, if a language is here, it's uh, undecidable but recognizable. If a language is here, it's not even recognizable. If it's here, it's decidable. Maybe it's regular as you get closer to here. Like, what is the most quote-unquote decidable languages? The notion of a many-one reduction really doesn't help you distinguish between indeci inside decidable. Like, you couldn't say anything about a regular language being more decidable than uh, a non-context-free language or something, because the reduction for those would be decidable to decidable. It would be fine. Because they both have deciders. You could just you run the deciders as the reduction. Um, it only works kind of around these four points. This is really the, the, the four things you can do. And uh, just to emphasize this, I'm going to prove the first one. And the other four, the other three are going to follow very similarly. Uh, similarly right? So the point is, just to reiterate, we don't have to repeat a diagonalization argument. We can perform a reduction to show language is undecidable using these things. So the, I'm going to prove the first one. B is decidable. Um, a is, uh, we're going to, if B is decidable, we're going to prove A is decidable. So first we get two things. First we get that B is decidable. And uh, that A is uh, many one reducible to B. And what that means is there exists a f computable function f uh, such that W is an A 
if and only if f of w is in b. So what we're going to do is just compute f of w and then test if it's in b. The, uh, you give a decider for a. So here's a decider for a on input w. Uh, compute uh, f of w. Uh, if f of w is in b, except because f of w being in b means w is in a. Uh, else, reject. So see how the, the decidability from, of b and the relationship of a many one reduction from a to b can be used to decide, give a decider for a, right? This also has many of the nice properties we would hope uh, such a, re uh, a reduction to have. Like, uh, if you recall when you did NP-completeness, you proved, we, well, you didn't prove SAT. We'll do that in this class. But you assumed SAT was NP-complete, and you, and you proved three SAT was NP-complete on these variants of SAT and on the coloring problems. And then you slowly grew up a, a nice bunch of problems so that if you're given a problem that you wanted to prove was NP-complete, you had a lot of things to choose from. Like, what was the most similar-looking problem? Same thing here. We're going to be able to prove... Uh, we're going to build up a set of undecidable languages and show that they're as unsolvable as each. You can't really say something is more unsolvable, really, because it's as unsolvable as anything else. It's unsolvable, right? Um, you can use, still use the idea of a reduction, though, to show it's like more to the right and therefore, quote unquote, more unsolvable. Um, any questions on the notion of a reduction? It also has some nice properties. So, for example, why is the reduction transitive? So, like, why is, it, why is it the case that A is mapping reducible to B and B is mapping reducible to C? Does that imply that A is mapping reducible to C? Yes, that is the definition of transitivity. And we're thankful that the relation is transitive. Well, why is it transitive? Because couldn't you go from a a is less than or yeah less than or equal to c by just kind of including that instead of being compute f of w be like f of g of w? Perfect. Compositions of computable functions is computable. You have two algorithms you can compose them by running them sequentially. So actually, I think there's a homework problem. Prove the compositions of computable functions is computable, right? So by the by the the reduction from a to z would be the compositions of the, the computable function from a to b and from b to c, right? That would give you something that goes from a to c, certainly. So it has all the nice properties we want. Any questions on what a reduction is? Uh, what's the point of it? What are we doing here? Are we going to the, the meet? So um, halt is the set of machine encodings and words such that uh, M halts on W. ATM is the set of machines and words such that M accepts W. ETM is, so this e ATM is an acceptance problem. ETM is an emptiness problem. This is the set of machines without words such that the language of the machine is uh, empty. So the machine either loops or rejects all strings. Okay. Given a machine, does it accept any word? This is more related to ATM than it is related to like the opposite of ATM, because if a machine accepts a single word, then it's not then it's not an ATM, right? So ATM also is undecidable. Uh, for similar reasons, ATM is undecidable. For similar reasons, halt is undecidable. But what's it, what's particularly going to be informative is the reduction that we're going to do. So we can't prove that uh, we would hope to prove a language is undecidable by reducing from ATM to ETM. However, it's an exercise in the Sipser book that such a reduction can't exist. So why it can't exist, we don't have time. But it's not too hard to work out. Instead of proving that ETM is undecidable by reducing from ATM, what we can do instead is prove uh, by reduction from ATM that the complement of ETM is undecidable. Right? If the complement of a language is undecidable, because the decidable languages are closed under complement, right? You swift to accept and reject. Uh, every time you say no, you say yes. Every time you say yes, you say no. 
Uh, if the complement of a language is undecidable, then the language itself must also be undecidable. So this is sufficient to show that ETM is undecidable. Agree? Okay. Now, how are we going to prove that ETM is undecidable? When you do a reduction, I kind of am sloppy about this. I kind of conflate the idea of a proof by contradiction with the reduction itself. So assume to the contrary. ETM is decidable. We give decider for ATM. Um, so it's going to be a decider for ATM. So it's, we're going to call it, I guess, A on input M comma W, because that's what ATM takes in. Now I'm going to say uh, build M prime hard coded from M W. Um, what that means, I will clarify in a second. If M prime is in ETM, so we assume to the contrary that ETM was decidable. If M prime is in ETM, we're going to reject. Else, we're going to accept. So uh, what is M prime? M prime on input, uh, we got to call it something other than W, so we're going to call it X. And it has hard-coded as variables M, which is somehow encoded, W, right? Um, what we're going to do is simulate uh, M on W. If... Uh, if it accepts, accept x. So there's actually kind of a lot going on here. You have one decider, which codes another program. You could probably believe you could do this. Write a program which, given its input, could hard code a different program. It sounds like you're getting close to compilers weird territory, but it's really just string pasting together, right? I've written Python to write HTML for me by just pasting different strings in the order I want them to. It's not that advanced, but you believe it's possible. Church Turing thesis, that should sound loud. However, then the program itself that you're coding simulates a third program, and that third program is this. So what is the behavior of M prime, basically? What is the language accepted by M prime? So basically, it turns out that the language of M prime is conditional. Um, so M prime, it's either going to, it's conditional on if M accepts W. This is probably the, this is such an important idea, it should be named something, but I don't know what to call it. The fact that the language of M prime is conditional on the acceptance of a fixed M on W, right? If M accepts W, we are going to accept X. Without even looking at what X is, we'll accept it, okay? That means we accept, if M does accept W, we accept all strings. So this could be sigma star. But if M does not accept, let's say M loops or rejects on W, then this never reaches this line that says accept X. So M prime would not accept any string if M rejects or loops on W. M prime would also reject or loop. But that's not what it says here. It says if it accepts. So this would, or, so this could be sigma star, or it could be the empty set. We don't know. Whichever one the language of M prime is, is conditional on the fact of M accept W, right? Because we have this right, this if statement right here, simulate M on W, if it accepts, we accept. We branch conditionally on the fact of hard-coded M and W. So if you could determine if M prime, which of M prime this was, sigma star or the empty set, you could determine uh, if M accepted W by this trick. So if you can, if you can decide ETM, you could decide if M prime was sigma star or the empty set. And then you could decide if M accepted W. Kind of a complicated argument. There's three machines going on here. Um, but basically, the reduction itself is what? It's going from um, the string M W and it's outputting the string M prime, right? We build M prime from M and W. Um, so if M prime... Uh, is an ETM. That's true if and only if uh, the language of M prime 
equal to the empty set, right? So if m prime is an ETM, the language of the m prime is the empty set. But if the language of m prime is the empty set, then we know uh, that m uh, does not accept w. So the language of m prime is the empty set only if m does not accept w. And if m does not accept w, we know that m comma w is not in uh, ATM. Similarly, if uh, m prime is not an ETM, uh, that's true if and only if, what is the other option that L, L of m prime could be? Could be sigma star, that's it, right? So, right, as we've defined, m prime can really only either be accept all strings or accept no strings. So the language of m prime has to be sigma star. If, m, if it's non empty, then it has to be sigma star. But if it's, it's only sigma star if m accepts w. And if m accepts w, we know then that uh, m comma w had to be in ATM. Right? So we've really shown that there's an if and only if between being an ETM and not being an ATM, right? So we can conclude here that we've performed a reduction from ATM to ETM. Complement, excuse me. So ETM comp because ATM is undecidable, ETM is ETM complement is undecidable. And because ETM complement is undecidable, ETM must also be undecidable. Doesn't say anything about recognition or anything like that yet, but certainly we've proved now that ETM, like ATM, like halt, is undecidable. Any questions on this proof? Okay, um, so this is our second real language. ATM is very similar to halt. ETM is not very similar to halt. It's got even different encodings. It's not even pairs of machines and words. It's just the machines themselves, and it's asking if they accept anything. Here's, a, here's another hard language, uh, EQTM. This consists of a pairs of machines, M1, M2, such that the machines are semantically equivalent. They have the same behavior, right? They accept exactly the same and only the same strings. Um, again, this has a different encoding. And this is actually a slightly more practical language than uh, other things. It's a huge area, probably, of software analysis and software re development to determine if two programs have the same behavior in all inputs, right? Um, from like a, even like from a virus standpoint, right? How do you know you're given a virus? How does virus detection work, right? It takes like a hash of it. Um, then let's say the virus maker does the same virus, but they change some variables around. How do you know that that's also, how do you know it's the same virus, right? That's a hard problem. Turns out it's also undecidable. Given two programs, are they semantically equivalent? In general, it's a hard problem. In specific cases, it's solvable. Just like in HALT, specific cases, it's solvable, right? If you can just look at it and see they just rename the variables, they didn't do a very good job of obfuscating it. So you can tell that they're equivalent. In general, though, it's undecidable. Um, this reduction is much easier than the ETM reduction. So let's think about it for maybe 30 seconds. See if we can get, why is EQTM uh, undecidable? Is that really the like, only way you could check is by brute force, like going through every single? So that would be a great intuition about why it is. But we need the proof. Why? That is, sorry, what? Why it isn't? Yes. Why is it undecidable? That's correct. Like, that is the correct intuition. Um, and anything, basically, we'll prove it in the second half, but anything that requires turning on the machine is undecidable. The things that are decidable are, are exactly the things which you can, look at, you can learn by having the machine be off. If anything requires the execution of the machine, the machine being on, turns out those are all undecidable. We'll prove that general idea later uh, today. Um, and this certainly requires turning on the machines, right? It requires uh, knowing something about the infinite idea. The machine on infinitely many inputs, yes. Um, but why would you, what is a good proof or a good reduction that EQTM is undecidable? So here's the idea. Um, 
you just check if it's empty. Def like is zero of x, right? Just going to return uh, x equals equals zero. Do you agree this function is correct? If you can determine equality, you can determine emptiness. So we're going to perform a reduction to etm. So assume to the contrary. EQ TM uh, is decidable. We give a decider uh, for ETM um, on input. It's a decider for ETM, which only takes on a machine. We're going to say M empty set. Uh, build, we'll say build m um, empty set to reject all strings. So m empty set just is a machine that we know rejects all strings, right? Uh, if the pair m m empty set is in etm, excuse me, in eqtm, then m has to also accept the empty string. Excuse me, accept no strings. Because if, this, if these are equal, and this one is the empty set, then this one has to be the empty set, right? Uh, so we accept. Else, reject. Believable? This is much, much simpler reduction than the ETM one, right? So by proving that ETM was undecidable, we could use that as a very simple reduction to prove EQTM was undecidable. So EQTM is undecidable for this reason. Let's work out um, like the if and only if part. So like um, the reduction here, of course, is going from M to this transformation, right? We're going so where do I put this? Maybe I'll put it here. So if uh, if m comma m empty set is in eqtm, that's true if and only if uh, l of m is equal to the empty set. But then that's true if and only if uh, m is in uh, etm, right? So here here we've uh, we've shown our reduction and we've shown now that etm is re mapping reducible. Uh, to EQTM. Right. We've related. So EQTM really is a more general problem than ETM. ETM is asking specifically, is it empty? And EQTM is asking, are they equal? And it turns out that if you can solve the more general problems. Certainly, you can solve the easier problem. So if the, if the specific problem is undecidable, the general problem couldn't be decidable either. Certainly, you might accidentally solve the easier problem. That's basically what this says. Any questions on the EQ, on EQTM? What it means? Yes. Wait, so this is like a specific case, but you said if the specific case is like undecidable, then the general case is also undecidable. You got to be careful when you apply that heuristic to certain things because every language. So sigma star is decidable because it's regular, but subsets of it are undecidable. So it's really about the difficulty of describing a certain set rather than thinking generality and specific as subsets. So I wouldn't think of it using set theoretic notation, but sort of a logical uh, idea. And that exact thing, rather than something like set ideas, has to be the reduction. The reduction is the, the idea that EQTM is more general than ETM. Right? That's basically what it is. Um, but it's not wrong to have that intuition at all, and that will help you uh, certainly do several problems. As a quick historical note on EQTM, so Alan Turing proved the halting problem, although he didn't, he didn't call it that. He proved the halting problem was undecidable. Um, Alonzo Church beat Alan Turing to the press by a few months, and he proved the equivalence of lambda calculi was not even recognizable. And there was no lambda calculi to compute the equivalence of lambda calculi. Um, because lambda calculated Turing complete, he basically proved through a much harder proof that EQTM was not recognizable and therefore not even decidable, even though he didn't know, I think, decidable 
versus recognizable or anything like that. But this was a, uh, an, an example of a historic problem. And in some sense, EQTM is actually much harder um, than ETM or HALT or any of these other things. And uh, we'll prove that next. Uh, for any uh, language uh, L and class uh, C, which is selection of languages. So a class is a selection of the languages. And a language itself is a selection of strings, right? So a class could be like decidable or regular or whatever. Uh, we say uh, L is in uh, what's called co, uh, co uh, C if... Um, L complement is in uh, C. So co-C is the class of languages which are themselves complements of C. It is not a complement of the class itself, but a complement of its elements, which are themselves languages. For example, the co-regular languages, because regular language are closed in a complement, has to be either regular languages. The co-decidable uh, languages are just the decidable languages because the decidable languages are closed in our complement. But the co-recognizable languages, turns out, are not uh, recognizable. Why? So here's, here's regular or context-free, right? So we have regular, and then we have like context-free, and then we have like decidable. Then we had that we proved that there were recognizable languages which were undecidable. But then we proved. But then we proved that the complements of some of those uh, recognizable but undecidable languages were uh, they would be what is known as co-recognizable. So they would. The diagram now kind of looks like this. So these are the co-recognizable languages. Instead of a, a, a straight ladder hierarchy, we now have two steps on the uh, at the last level. We have the decidable languages, and we then have two generalizations, either recognizable or the co-recognizable. It turns out like HALT and ATM are here. Damn. Um, so it turns out that we proved that we gave a recognizer for ATM. Um, then we gave a recognizer for HALT. So both HALT and ATM are recognizable and undecidable. And because uh, they're recognizable and not decidable, the complements of ATM and the complements of HALT are also not decidable. But they're, not, they're also not recognizable because language and complement being recognizable are unrecognizable. So they're actually over here. Uh, ATM complement and HALT complement are co-recognizable, not recognizable, and not decidable. The decidable languages are exactly those which are both recognizable and co-recognizable, and the, because that's exactly the class of languages of the recognizable ones which are closed under complement. Um, so the decidable languages are the intersection of the recognizable and the co-recognizable, right? Everything it seems to, for so far um, might be either recognizable or co-recognizable, though. So we proved that HALT was not recognizable, but maybe it's co-recognizable. So this is our final coping method, or final generalization. Do there exist any languages which are not recognizable or even co-recognizable? 
And a language is co-recognizable if its complement is recognizable. Can you, think, can you think of any reason there might be, exist languages which are not even recognizable? Which are not, does there exist anything out here, basically? So here's the decidable, decidable languages, our definition and algorithm. Is there anything that's way beyond here on the scale? Can you think of a way to prove there's a language which is not even, which is neither recognizable or co-recognizable? Yes? Could you do something with like countability? Absolutely. Is it like? There's uncountably many languages. The definition of recognizable and co-recognizable still implies that there's countably many of them. But this is still countably many of the languages. So there's uncountably many total languages. There's uncountably many recognizable and co-recognizable languages. There's undecidable, excuse me, uncountable many languages. So there has to exist one language at least, which is not uh, co-recognizable or recognizable. Um, we can actually prove uh, something harder. We're going to prove next that EQTM and the complement of EQTM are so unsolvable that neither of them are recognizable or co-recognizable. There is no recognizer for, for ETM or complement of ETM. Excuse me, no recognizer or, there's no recognizer for ETM or its complement. Neither of them are co-recognizable. They're both totally unrecognizable and uncorecognizable. Getting a little mixed up here. These are very hard languages in some sense. Hard is the wrong word. They're very unsolvable. They're more unsolvable than halt. Right? There's absolutely, and that goes back to the intuition about like having to run them on all inputs, because given a machine and a word for ATM or halt, you can at least test if it is in there just by running it. And you have a chance, maybe it works. There's nothing, you have no chance, basically. That's what it says. Um, so the Sipser book proves, uh, well, actually, first let me prove, how do we prove something is not recognizable? How do we, uh, well, we're going to combine some facts, right? Um, if A is mapping reducible to B, and A is unrecognizable, then B is unrecognizable. Right? So B more unsolvable than A. If A is not even recognizable, then B is not even recognizable. Um, ATM is recognizable. Undecidable. The complement of ATM is unrecognizable, undecidable, but co recognizable. Right? Because it's recognizable, the complement of the language has to be co-recognized. Because ATM is recognizable, complement of ATM has to be co-recognizable. Um, if uh, A is many one reducible to B, then that implies that a complement is many one reducible to B complement. Why is this last one true? The reduction, for, the reduction from A to B takes the good to good and the bad to the bad. So just take the bad to the bad and the good to the good, right? If you think of the picture, right? It's going to map the good to the good, fine, but then it also maps the bad to the bad. If it didn't, it wouldn't map the good to the good. Simple kind of idea. This certainly is true. So in order to prove, um, uh, to prove B, uh, to prove, to prove some uh, B is unrecognizable, prove uh, that it is beyond ATM, right? So ATM, complement of ATM is unrecognizable. So we can prove that it's more unsolvable than ATM, complement, then it has to be unrecognizable, right? But, so that's how you would prove a language is unrecognizable. Um, but that, you can also, is equivalent to proving uh, that ATM, there's a mapping reduction from ATM to B complement, right? 
So if you can produce, produce a reduction from B complement to ATM, from ATM to B complement, B is unrecognizable. That's the idea that we're going to use to show um, uh, some language. Some, we're gonna, that's, that's the idea we're going to show that EQTM and its complement are neither recognizable or co-recognizable. So first we're going to prove that EQTM is not recognizable. Now, the Sipser book actually does this reduction, but I think I found a shortcut using like the arithmetic of the reductions without having to do all that. Um, it's more informative if you see the reduction, though, so I'll, I'll just mention it, that it, there is, it does exist in the book. But we proved the following. First, we gave a reduction from ETM, uh, excuse me, from ATM to the complement of ETM, right? Then, but that implies that there is a reduction from ATM complement to ETM, right? Next, we gave a reduction from ETM uh, to EQTM. Because the reduction is transitive, combine that statement with that statement, you get what? You get the complement of ATM. Uh, there's as many one reducible to EQTM. And since ATM is not complement, ATM complement is not recognizable, neither is EQTM. We can conclude there that EQTM is not recognizable. Right? You could actually do the reduction, and it's informative that you do it, but this is a shorter proof to convince ourselves that EQTM is not uh, recognizable. Now, now we want to prove that uh, uh, EQTM is not co-recognizable. Well, by definition of co-recognizable, we it's enough for us to show. Um, that the complement of EQTM isn't uh, recognizable. Right? So if we can prove, uh, to prove something is unrecognizable, you prove it's a reduction from some un unrecognizable languages, like some unrec unrecognizable languages such as the complement of ATM. So we would want to prove a reduction from ATM complement to EQTM complement to prove EQTM is uncorecognizable. But this, by uh, again with the arithmetic of the reductions, is just the same as showing uh, that a a there is a reduction from ATM uh, to EQTM. So it's sufficient for us to prove a reduction from ATM to EQTM instead of going the route through um, ETM complement. So we can just give this reduction exactly, and it's sufficient. Yes? Can you use like, the same function that you use for like, the complement, where you just do like M, but instead of M, where it accepts only the empty set, you just have it be sigma star? And then from there? I don't remember off the top of my head. But I think there's some, I think we, we, there's some trouble when you try and compose those reductions exactly because of this little hiccup where there is no reduction from ATM to ETM, for reasons that I won't explain. It is a problem in the book. But there is no such reduction from ATM to ETM. And we know there is a reduction, though, from ETM to EQTM. So then that reduction doesn't, I don't think that way works, where you can just, where you, um, I know what you're talking about. When we say, if M accepts W, we accept X, that gives us either sigma star or the empty set. The problem with that is, though, you so can't take the logical complement because the inputs that the machine loops on, are still, it's still going to loop on those inputs, right? So it doesn't flip those from, it doesn't reject those inputs, but it doesn't accept them. So they're not in the language. So now they're not in the complement language. By rejecting, denoting that as accepting, the looping is still the looping thing, right? It's this like secret third, three value logic kind of thing. Um, so we're just going to give a reduction from ATM to EQTM. So we're gonna, our reduction is going to take a pair of uh, machine and word m comma w and it's going to output um, this this uh, what I'm going to call m2 and m sigma star
So uh, f on input, uh, it's going to take inputs from ATM, and once output, it wants to output things that are going to be correctly in EQTM. So first, we're going to build uh, m sigma star to accept all strings if uh, m accepts w. Nope. M sigma star just accepts all strings. Uh, build M2 hard coded from uh, M and W. Uh, and M2 is going to look like this on input X, uh, which got M hard coded. And it's got W hard coded. Uh, simulate M on W uh, if it accepts accept. So notice that this machine uh, is similar to the last one for ETM. It's going to accept either. Um, the empty set, it's going to, the language it accepts is going to either, excuse me, the language that it recognizes is going to either be the empty set or sigma star. Conditional on if m accepts w, right? So what we're going to do is if it's equal, if we can determine the equality between uh, m sigma star and m2, we can determine if m accepts w, right? So if uh, m2 uh, comma m sigma star are in EQTM, uh, then we know that M2 accepts all strings, which we know M accepts W, so we can accept. Else, reject. So why is this true? If uh, M2 if M2 comma M sigma star uh, is in EQTM, that's true if and only if. Well, m sigma star, the language of m sigma star, it's obviously sigma star because it accepts all strings. The language of m2 has to be sigma star. Right? Any qualms about that? And the language of m2 is sigma star if, uh, only if it passes this conditional where, and it only passes that conditional if m accepts w. So, Uh, which is true then if and only if m comma w is in ATM. Uh, similarly, if m2 comma m sigma star is not in EQTM, that's true if and only if L of m2, too faint, nope, L of m2 uh, was not sigma star, so it, was, it could only have been the empty set. It rejects all strings. And that's true if and only if uh, M rejects W, or loops on W, uh, which is true if and only if. Um, These markers are terrible. Uh, M comma W was not in ATM. Right. So here we've proven directly that there is a reduction from a ATM to EQTM, and that is sufficient for us to prove that there is a reduction from a uh, TM complement to EQTM complement, which means there is a, that means EQTM complement um, is not uh, recognizable, which means EQTM was not even co-recognizable. So this is uh, sufficient for us to know um, this. I have one final little table I want to do. So we've talked about uh, DFAs, uh, NFAs, rejects, and we've talked about CFG and PDA, and then we've talked about Turing machines and their variants, right? Um, but these all have
These all have um, acceptance problems of their own. So we'll call it A blank, E blank, uh, EQ blank, and uh, all blank. Right? So the acceptance problem for Turing machines, we've proved that ATM is undecidable. So I'll put a U here. We've also proved that ETM is undecidable. We proved EQTM is undecidable. And for similar reasons to ETM and EQTM, it turns out all TM, uh, the set of Turing machine encodings which accept all strings, this is also undecidable for a similar reason. Right? You could perhaps believe that. Um, for DFAs and NFAs, uh, is the acceptance problem for DFAs decidable or undecidable? I give you a DFA and a word. Does the DFA accept the word? Decidable or undecidable? Uh, Why? Exactly. Just do it. Just give the DFA. It, it runs at exactly the length of the string number of steps. Um, the emptiness problem for DFAs is if DFA accept any string. Can you repeat the question? Uh, I give you a DFA. You determine, give me an algorithm or prove there doesn't exist one if the DFA accepts any string. Go backtrack. Yeah, sometimes a graph search algorithm from an accept state to the start. Decidable. EQ DFA. So is that like two? two? I give you two DFAs. Do they accept exactly the same strings? That There's several proofs of this one, actually. Would that be true because they're like topologically the same? It's certainly true if they are the same, but what if they're not? That would be the easy case. Like sometimes EQTM is decidable if the two programs are character for character identical. But if they're not, there's the quest, they're still allowed to be semantically equivalent, right? Slightly more difficult problem, but uh, let's think about it. Two ways I, I, I would prove EQTM for, excuse me, EQDFA is decidable. One, um, turns out there, you wouldn't know this, but there's an algorithm to minimize DFAs. And every DFA has a unique minimal one for every language, right? So you just take two DFAs, apply this minimization algorithm, you get the same thing. Then you check they're topologically equivalent, and then you get uh, that they're, qual they're equal. Another way is you can use closure. You can compute the symmetric difference of two languages, and it, uh, it has to be empty. If the symmetric difference of two languages is empty, the intersection of two languages is... I don't remember exactly, but using you can compute the XOR of two languages. And if the XOR is empty, no string is in one and not the other, so then they have to accept the same thing. So you just check the emptiness of the DFA you created using closure oper operations of the symmetric difference. So this is also decidable. All DFA is decidable by checking the same reason E DFA is decidable, checking if there in, a reject state is reachable from the start state. This is also decidable. Why is ACFG decidable? I give you a string and a word. Huh? So the answer I'm actually looking for is Chomsky normal form. You, it's difficult to determine for a non-deterministic device if it actually produces it. You could just do it, but in practice, you get the, the Chomsky normal form guarantees that you can do it within this exact number of steps. So that, also decidable. Emptiness problem for CFGs. Very difficult, actually. This is a very, very difficult backtracking algorithm. You take each non-terminal and you like mark it if it produces a string, and then you apply the rule backwards and you see if the if the start state can produce a string ever, right? So you go non-terminal by terminal, see if it produces any characters, and then if any non-terminals produce those non-terminals and so on. Very difficult idea there, but kind of maybe at high level is fine. Here's a here's a tough one: the equality between CFGs or even PDAs, because those are the same. Is equality between CFGs decidable or undecidable? Two non-deterministic grammars producing objects, do they produce the same set of strings? Can you put them both in Chomsky normal form and then compare them? Ah, so in some, this is a fun fact I love, because Chomsky normal form is not really, in the spirit, a normal form. It does not, it's, not, it's not a syntactic description of the semantic object. The two languages which are equivalent may not have the same Chomsky normal form. Unfortunately, right? A normal form, I would like to think, is, is, has, that, has that feature, except Chomsky normal form. Like two arrays, certainly the sorted arrays are the same. If the sorted arrays are the same, 
then the arrays contain the same elements, right? Yes? Is there a minimal PDA like there was in DFA? Ah, it turns out there is no minimal PDA. Spoiler, I'll tell you, this is undecidable. Given two CFGs, determine if they're equal is undecidable. Proof would take a full lecture. I don't have time for it. It's in the book. Basically, you make a CFG that checks if a machine accepts a word. Like, syntactically, you can check. You can force a machine. You can create a grammar which only produces, a, which could only produce the computation history of a machine accepting a word, which can only exist if the machine did accept the word. Convoluted argument, but it exists, and it's crazy that it's there. For a similar reason, you can do reduction from all to EQ. So uh, all, the, all CFG is also undecidable. The point of me doing this chart is to show you that as the, as the structure gets more and more powerful, as you are able to recognize more languages and decide more things, you certainly get more and more undecidable problems, right? Most problems about Turing machines are undecidable. You can't do anything with them. But the CFGs, there's some things you can do with them and some things you can't, right? You can't determine equality between CFGs, fine. But they're more powerful than the DFAs. So it's kind of like this trade-off you get for the universality. As, as the more Turing complete you get, the more undecidable problems you bring with you. Right? That's really what this, uh, this chart is saying. And of course, there's context-sensitive grammars and, and, and things like this. And those have their own undecidable problems. The DFAs, CF, the DFAs NFAs, and regulars are ridic ridiculously simple. So every problem about them has to be decidable. But as you get farther away from there, uh, you get more unsolvable, certainly. 